Hello, good evening and welcome to Ignite Somerset's Creative Network, coming to you live. I'm laughing because it's actually the second time I've said this, um, and I'll even explain more in a minute, but we're coming to you live from uh, the engine room. Uh, now, as you will be aware, as probably regular attendees of Creative Network, this is a platform to find out more about an artist, a local artist. And I'm absolutely delighted that this evening, yeah. our special guest is none other than former Somerset film creative technologist, Richard Tomlinson. Yeah, let's go for Rich. <laughs> So this uh, event is a hybrid event. We've got a, a live audience with us, but also hopefully, fingers crossed, she says, we are now going out live um, uh, via Facebook. Now, as many of you will be aware, of course, all things creative and technolo technological have been very much uh, the uh, in the domain of Richard Tomlinson. And today, all of that uh, technology aspect fell to me, and hence why <laughs> it didn't work uh, the first time we did it. But I'm delighted that um, it is now working. Um, and thank you to everyone here for their patience and to everybody uh, online who's been watching. Um, so Richard, of course, is uh, a much loved, uh, member of our team or what I have to say was now was a much loved he's still much loved he's just no longer a member of our team because uh, he has decided to devote all of his energy and creativity to developing his own work as an artist mm -hmm. um, and we are absolutely delighted for him um, he's now got to pretend that he hasn't answered this question already because I've already <laughs> asked him what once uh, but Rich I've been privileged enough to be able to be in the room and watch you work um, many, many times, and you have often referenced the photographer Cartier Bresson and the decisive yeah. moment. So, my question to you is what was the decisive moment for you when you decided that the way forward was as an artist? That was a great segue. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Not at all rehearsed. <laughs> Yeah, so just first of all, the, the decisive moment, um, coin, a phrase coined by Cartier-Bresson. Um, and uh, so th this is basically the, that, that idea that a photographer will have their camera and they, they might understand how to, you know, adjust all the settings, the focus and so on. But um, in order to make a really interesting photograph that really exploits all of the potential in photography. An understanding of the decisive moment is, is a good thing. So, um, you know, he, he, um, he made a very, if you, if you Google Cartier-Bresson, uh, a really good example of the decisive moment is, which is basically being in the right place at the right time. Um, he took a photograph of um, a, boy jumping across a puddle. The boy was silhouetted against um, the sky and there's a wall in the photograph as well. On the wall there's a poster advertising the Moscow State Circus and in the graphics of that poster there's a boy leaping and he's silhouetted uh, within the poster as well uh, and his reflection is within the poster as well. So it may have been constructed or it may have been the decisive moment, who knows. But what Cartier-Bresson was really interested in is that the language of photography. So, you know, through composition, through, you know, the uncanny ability of the photographer to bring different elements together, something incredible can happen within that frame. Um, my decisive moment uh, wasn't as quick as that, wasn't a thousandth of a second, uh, or even a second. It was <laughs> growing up. Uh, at home, um, uh, and slowly, you kind of the, the environment that I had at home, and I didn't know it at the time, was le having an impact on me. So I went all the way through school, not really learning very much. Um, I was one of those people, like a lot of people, school just didn't suit them. So I mean, I remember <laughs> walking. I remember walking around at break time, 
wondering where my next lesson was, wondering what my le next lesson was, <laughs> having no clue. So I used to hang around with other people who I sort of knew had the same kind of rotor that I did. <laughs> so I didn't engage for some reason. And then when I left school, uh, that was when my learning curve started to, to go through the roof, really, because I was afforded an opportunity to hang out with other creative people on my one year foundation course. Just one year? One year foundation course at Wolverhampton Polytechnic. <laughs> Thank you, Wolverhampton Polytechnic. <laughs> um, and um, so then, then suddenly, you know, I was reflecting on why, why was it that I, you know, that I ended up doing this, this course uh, for a year, doing a little bit of all sorts of different creative stuff. And I was, yeah, I was given that time to sort of reflect on, on, on my influences. And I believe that it was growing up in a, a, a household that was very churchy. I'm saying it like that because I don't want this, this isn't going to suddenly get very religious. So it's a very churchy house. <laughs> um, and my dad was the local vicar at the local parish church and a very high churchman. And so incense and candles and monstrances, look that up on Google if you're not sure what it is, <laughs> icons, iconography, um, was all very important. Sunday by Sunday by Sunday and during the week as well. And I was a server or an altar boy. And uh, so I got to kind of participate in it as well. So, you know, and that the, the, re, the, the religiosity of it didn't impact on me, but the theatre did. And, um, you know, through, through those formative years, and actually I count my formative years as, you know, from not just from zero to five, but from zero to sort of 18 really, <laughs> was spent looking at icons and, um, and yeah, and kind of the, it, what was really interesting to me was that idea of revering images. And, you know, that's something that some religions actually don't do. Mm. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's actually something that wouldn't happen, that images are false gods and so on. But um, certainly with my upbringing, it, it was very much about a reverence to images and pictures and icons. We would have called them icons. We wouldn't have called them images. Um, but I went on then to realise that actually you know, it, it had an impact on me and my fascination in looking at pictures and making pictures myself. It's so wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I mean, it's a bit of a classic that um, I've worked with you for eight years, yeah. but as you know, it gets really busy here and, and we're always in, you know, looking to the next thing that we're going to do. So, so to have this moment to be able to look closely at, at your body of work is, is just such a wonderful opportunity. So I'm just going to um, bring up some some images. Um, so Rich, yeah, this is a wonderful photograph. It's a stunner, isn't it? I've not and I've not seen it before. So tell us all yeah, about it. Yeah. So so I um, I went on to do this foundation course, and I um, I knew that photography was going to be the thing that I did, and. I, I, I kind of left, I left that course and was looking for work and like a lot of people that have just finished an arts course, you know, I knew I'd do some kind of degree course in the future, but I was looking for work and I um, went for this job as a youth worker in Wolverhampton on a summer scheme and uh, that was a, that was again a, a moment where my learning curve was going through the roof because I was then in the workplace for the first time. I'd spent all this time at school not learning anything. Spent some time at, at a college, at a polytechnic, and then I um, and then I was in a workplace. And uh, basically, I remember it to this day: going for the interview to get this job as um, a summer scheme worker, and. Um, the, the youth worker interviewing me said, oh, well, what skills can you bring? And I said, well, I'm really interested in photography. 
So, oh, okay, can we do some photography then? So um, I went along to this um, block of flats in uh, Wensfield, which is a sort of an area of, of near Wolverhampton. And I went with a rucksack with some different cameras in it. And uh, there was a medium format camera. And you know, I was going to enthuse about Cartier Bresson, like I just said. <laughs> and obviously, you know, the young people were not in the slightest bit interested <laughs> in that or in me or in any of my cameras. And uh, so um, I, I th that was a really rapid learning process for me. And I remember the youth worker saying to me, you're not going to come back, are you? And I said, well, I've got to come back <laughs> because I haven't got any money and I need, I need some work. So the following week, I went back with a rucksack full of disposable cameras with black and white film in them, uh, thinking that, well, we could at least get to process these and maybe we could even print them in a dark room. And from that moment, I realised, I, I, I understood what participation was and what what facilitating creative activities was all about. It was about, in this instance, bringing a bag full of disposable cameras with me. <laughs> it wasn't about bringing my world to, to these people. It was about, you know, me hopefully being allowed to enter their world. They got hold of these cameras. I, I just had time to show them how to force the flash by pressing a button on them. And they went running around the flats taking the most amazing photographs, bursting into people's flats, just running up to them, taking photographs, and then running out again. <laughs> people shouting at them, causing all sorts of mayhem. And I realised that not only were they a fantastic group of young people, they were taking the kinds of photographs that I couldn't possibly take. They were taking better photographs than I could take, even after I'd done my one-year foundation course. You know. <laughs> so um, anyway, on to that picture that you just showed. It was important to me that I took something away from it. And, and that was a particular picture that I did take with the camera that I brought along with me. My, my twin lens, that's me rolling the film on, Mamiya camera. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I, I started taking photographs of some of the young people that I was working with. And, um, you know, it was a way of me continuing my own practice as well. So, so it was interesting, even all those years ago, hundreds of years ago, um, I was trying to find that balance of doing some work that's going to pay me some money and also trying to maintain a practice as well. Um, there's a few more photographs. If it, yeah. uh, I don't, did we show, I yeah. think we've only shown the first one so far. I then went on to, um, interested in taking photographs of people, interested in people looking straight down the barrel of the lens, straight at the viewer. That was really what was of interest to me. And inspired by photographers like Diane Arbus, who um, famously photographed all kinds of people. Um, I think she called them strange people. She, she might not have even been that kind about them, but she went into Central Park and photographed people that she just saw hanging out. The massively wide demographic of people that hung out in Central Park. And um, she always made square photographs. They were always quite symmetrical it always had the person looking straight down the lens. And that's why the photographs were so engaging. And the photographer Richard Avedon, also American photographer, um, toured um, the great American West and photographed people, uh, Americans, just looking straight at the lens with a great big large format camera. I, I, when, when looking at his beautiful work in these beautiful books, um, you know, I imagine that this was Richard Avedon, probably had a van, you know, with his big 5x4 or 10 8 large format camera in the back. And then he would set it all up with a white background. And all these photographs were taken outside with a mix of available light and artificial light. And then I saw a photograph of him actually working. And he had a team of like eight or nine <laughs> technicians. And he, he just sat in his van, basically, <laughs> whilst they set it up. And then he just fired the, the cable release when, when it was ready. So that, that particular photograph you just saw was a, is a photograph of a mime artist called Hissy. Um, and um, he was photographed at Alton Towers. And I had, a, again, finding work that would pay some money. 
So I, I worked in the entertainment department at Alton Towers for about two years and um, photographed some of the entertainers there, dancers, skaters, mime artists, jugglers. Um, I, I was the costume character. I was Henry <laughs> Hound. Henry. And, and, and Henrietta sometimes. Um, but when I wasn't doing that, I was busy trying to keep my practice going and, and taking photographs. I was. Gonna, I mean, you, met, you mentioned it in terms of you said you were looking in a book because, of course, I'm afraid we're old enough to be pre-internet. So yeah. So it was. You know, where were you getting these books from? Were they? Because in those days, I think they were quite expensive kind of yeah. photography books, weren't yeah. they? Expensive books. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a trip to the library yeah. to look to look in books, and really that initial year of training, and then I then went on to do um, a, a degree, which, which was fantastic that gave me uh, you know access to that resource which is that library that's got those books in right. i couldn't possibly afford um and yeah you're right you know you would you know you'd have a recommendation of of um uh, of richard avedon and uh, and but yeah it wasn't like a search engine as such where you would instantly if you like this you might like all these other things then uh yeah, no, it wasn't like that at all. There was much more an element of um, really trying to understand Richard Avedon's influences, for example, and see where he was coming from and looking at what drove Diane Arbus to make those incredible photographs uh, and look at you know, what her influences were like. I mean, we're going we're gonna to come on and look at some of your more recent um, work because what surprised me was you've only become a recent adopter of Instagram. And this yeah. and this format, I mean, this I is this is Instagram all over, isn't it? This Instagram this image, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, a recent adopter, yeah, late to the party for a lot of things. <laughs> but have you been conscious when you've been making work that you are? Uh, no, I'll ask you later because we'll cut, we'll look at that okay. as to whether you're you're creating work for the for the platform. Yeah. Let's have a look at this one, another. Yeah, the square format. Yeah, so there's there's a few more square pictures that we can look at. So, I I I went I I, I did some work over at, at Alton Towers. Learned a lot there. It was good fun. It was quite nice in a way to get out of the highbrow arts world and hang out with you know um, street entertainers for for a living. That was great fun. Um, and in fact. I'd still be there now, actually. But to, <laughs> we did two two seasons, and then they decided they only wanted equity card holders, so we had to leave. That sounds no good. This probably did me a favour in a way. I, I then left and then went, went to um, to a, a, um, a degree course and it, that was just about photography, um, and continued my learning, and then. Um, the, the photograph that you just saw of, of the young man there, this is a photograph that was taken at Brymore School. And, um, Brymore? Yeah. Don't, oh, just down the yeah, road? Yeah, I, I I, I've jumped a bit now. We've moved, I've moved to Somerset. Okay. And I, I got my first piece of work, paid piece of work, to make photographs, so, which was amazing. So um, it was a piece of work that involved doing the facilitation, making photographs with... Um, young people that lived along the trail of the River Parrot. Um, did some work here in Bridgewater and in Langport and in other places. But I also had an opportunity, a paid opportunity to take photographs, uh, to, to make some photographs of, of, it was a project called Born on the River. So these were people that were born along the trail of the River Parrot. Right. So yeah, so you, you can skip through these a little bit if you want. So yeah, this was, um, a picture of a boy that was at the Brymore School. This one is interesting. You know the place Tinker's Bubble? Yes. You've heard of Tinker's yes. Bubble? So I um, went up to Tinker's Bubble and uh, made some photographs of the residents there. And so we've got this little boy here. Um, this is his home and he's just peeking out with his revolver. <laughs> and there's, there's Interestingly, there is a, it's only just occurred to me, there is actually a photograph that was made by Diane Arbus of two boys uh, in Central Park holding toy revolvers. It's just occurred to me. That. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this one was up at Tinker's Bubble. I think the next view are probably Tinker's Bubbles. Oh no, yeah, this, this was 
um, to boys who aren't um, twins, who aren't who aren't even brothers. Oh wow! No, they're just two lads that know each other, um, and they're wearing the same top, and they look very very similar in a in a field of corn. That's really beautiful. Um, and then th these were all shot on my trusty old Mamiya twin lens camera um, process. This again is up at Tinker's Bubble. Um, uh, a, a girl with a silver she's so cute in her hand this 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 particular picture um kind of the benchmark i, I knew I'd, I'd sort of really made it with that particular picture because that picture my parents said to me oh that's a great picture and they framed it and put it on their wall at home that, <laughs> that mean i knew i'd made it at that point you know <laughs> it had all come full circle all of those years sort of and here I was making these strange photographs of, of, of unusual people in, um, and yeah, that made it onto, onto, the, onto the wall at home. Um, amongst, the, amongst the icons. Amongst all of the icons, yeah. of course, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the next picture is. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is interesting. So this is very, very different. I, I, I continue to, I, I, I built up a bit of um, a profile in Somerset for uh, as a facilitator running projects arts projects and got to do all sorts of activities uh, with all sorts of groups in 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 rural Somerset and in the towns as well um, usually sort of focused around photography or, or filmmaking um, incidentally that came out of you know that came out of early projects that I was doing in Wolverhampton in the Midlands and I was doing work with the youth service, as, as I've already mentioned. And then I got on to do some work with the probation service, working with men on probation. So just backtracking a little bit, some really interesting stories to tell about working with men on probation, some of which I can't share uh, to this audience or online. <laughs> um, but really interesting, really learned a lot about people and uh, certainly what made these men tick. Um, and uh, yeah, some really interesting um, stories to tell from from that one. So anyway, I, I I'd done lots of participatory stuff. So you know that whole thing of realizing that participation is about entering into somebody else's or or some another group's world, and mm. and cre and you as the artist create an environment in which those people can be creative, rather than you coming along and saying right do this. Yeah. So so. Um, I was doing lots of work around um, facilitating community groups and so on. And then I decided that, oh, okay, so I was living in Derby at this time, actually. I, I moved back to the Midlands. <laughs> so I was up and down the country, moved back to the Midlands, working for an, uh, an arts organisation in, in Derby and, and freelancing. And um, an opportunity came up to do a postgraduate course. And here I was, somebody who, you know, didn't learn anything at school at all, contemplating doing this post postgraduate course. So, so I enrolled onto it and got onto this course, which was just amazing. So um, I was continuing at this point to do my thing of photographing people and kind of and making what I thought were interesting images, icons or whatever, however you want to call them. And I it was a really interesting time because I was sharing my work with my peers on the course, with my tutor, and I discovered that what I was doing could be problematic or could be seen as being problematic. Because there I was making photographs with um, uh, people, all sorts of people, some vulnerable people as well. Mm. I, was, I, in a way, had a passport to, you know, getting to know and having a really rapport with all sorts of people through the paid work I was doing facilitating projects um, and oftentimes you know the the group if I was if I said we're doing this creative stuff together do you mind if I take some photographs as well and often that would be yeah no that'd be really fantastic we'd love to see what you do as well so within that kind of world it was fine and outside of that world when I was with other photographers and with academics I realized that there was a moral issue potentially a moral issue here yeah that I was uh, making these photographs and sharing them 
and talking about the composition, you know, <laughs> or talking about how, oh, this is, this is inspired by this photographer. Um, and, the, and, and is there the, the difficulty that they might not then think about where that image is going to go and how? It, was, it wasn't so much that because it, everything was done and everything was done with consent. It was more that who am I to kind of, you know, say what these photographs are actually about and, and unpick that, you know. Um, so, so it became a bit of a moral dilemma for me. Um, and I was really challenged on it at, at, um, at, some moment, at certain moments on, on, the, on the course. And I didn't know whether, what to do. I didn't know whether I should um, really make this the point of my research. And, re you know, really, cause there, there was a big chunk of written work that had to be completed. And maybe that was actually the focus of my, of my, my thesis, if you like the morality of this yeah um and it was interesting because it was a conversation that was happening amongst photographers and nationally renowned photographers i'm not a nationally renowned photographer but you know it was happening um, you know with the nick wadlingtons and the martin pars and so on who were going out and photographing people mm. and having them exhibited in the icon gallery and so on and tate modern you know and um you know the likes of martin parr never really questioned the morality of it they just did it and they said well look they're great they're great photographs um the nick wapplington this is he was an interesting photographer he got criticized um for making photographs that were patronizing and, and, and so on because he was photographing um one family um uh, and kind of revealing all of their flaws in inverted commas and it was later revealed that that was his own family he was their son. <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, so because this because this is not this is not they're not intended as uh, kind of documentary photo photos they're, and they're mm. not intended as, as journalism. So that so is, is that why then there's that, yes. that kind of moral question around yes. it? Yes, and it, and it's and it's one that I, I you either see it as difficult to defend or you just don't bother defending it. You, you know, you're such a great photographer with such a great eye that you just do it anyway. Uh, and, you know, your agent makes sure that they get exhibited and published in books. But I, I was having a, um, myself, I suppose, um, I, I was in a moral dilemma about it myself, um, which I probably wouldn't be in now, um, interestingly, but at the time I was. So I thought to myself, perhaps I should use this as an opportunity to do something completely different. Right, and that's when it, it came onto that image that you just saw, which oh, not that one. Um, but that, that I mean, any of these pictures Hang are fine. On, yeah. um, that building I'll might get be it. familiar. I'll get to into you, that right? one. Hang yeah. On. So, so um, we, you know, this was a time when digital technology was now becoming um, more accessible and affordable, and um, uh, I, I found myself in a position where I was going out shooting photographs and then creating composite images with these uh, uh, and creating kind of um, uh, con like constructed realities, if you like. So that these are, you might know some of these, um, in these places. There, it's, this is the sort of Birmingham area. Yeah, I was going to say the gas works, but, but I don't yeah. think they're there anymore, are they? No, Which not. is why we've got a gas shortage, because yeah. <laughs> they yes. take them all down. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so this became about um, the kind of formal language of photography. And I was then looking at different influences. So I was looking at the Dusseldorf School of Photography. This is a school of photography that has a very formal approach to photography, um, a very minimalist approach to photography. Um, so um, there's a, a husband and wife team called Bernd and Hilla Bescher. Who are very famous you can google them um, <laughs> and they were obsessed with cooling towers mm. and pylons and uh, kind of utility structures and industrial structures uh, and gasometers and so on yeah. um, and i loved their work and i loved the kind of coldness and the formality of their work again they were all i i, I often think that they're square but they were actually rectangular they were always up, up, um, upright shots like this, shot on a big 10 by 8 camera. 
And um, they were always very symmetrical. There was never any people in the photographs. There was never any suggestion of the seasons or of the weather. It was just white sky with a, <laughs> with a, with a, a gasometer in it. Um, and um, in a way, you, you need to look at the photographs and, and look at the whole portfolio of photographs because this was an obsession. They would go all across <laughs> Europe. Uh, there's there's few photographs in 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 the UK as well, but it's mainly continental Europe. Um, photographs of these structures, um, and they then went on to um, teach um, a very famous photographer, Andreas Skursky, who creates these enormous, again kind of constructed realities. These are in colour, not black and white like the the um, Bescher photographs. They're they're saturated colour and um, um, th there's an interesting thing going on with, with this, again, a German photographer, with this photographer's work where you're not quite clear what you're looking at. Is that a photograph or is that some, some kind of constructed reality? Yeah. And that got to really interest me. Um, so I started to explore that myself in my own work and still with a sort of fairly cool approach to composition. Uh, i.e. looking at symmetry um, and looking at repetition, but, but, but introducing repetition um, and looking at kind of patterns that, um, you know, good photographers can find just through shooting a photograph anyway. But it was a time, an exciting time of exploring digital technology. So I kind of upped the ante a little bit and started to sort of really... Um, to sort of really explore the idea of repetition and, and repeating patterns. And, and so in a way, I, su I suppose for a moment, I wasn't a photographer anymore. I was doing something else. I don't quite know what it was, but <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the, those particular images come from. Okay, let's move on to, so here again, repeated pattern. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a straightforward photograph. Um, but again, you can see that, uh, that that's actually back down here in Somerset, that's the multi-story car park here in Taunton. Yeah. In, in, yeah, in Taunton, yeah, just down the road. So um, just moving on now to um, getting that opportunity to, to actually make some work and, and, and to be paid for it, which was just fantastic. Um, so working with um, the um, Museum of Somerset in uh, Taunton and collaborating with some other artists uh, I got to participate in this project um, called the Discovery Room. It was called various things. It was called Reveal the Museum as well at, at, a, for, at one moment. Um, and, um, and then it was called New Dimensions eventually. And these pictures that we're looking at here, uh, these are composite photographs again that were, that were shot in the stores at the Heritage Centre. Uh, so I went. I took photographs of um, structures that were um, machines that were built for um, for agricultural or industrial use, and um, uh, I created these composite images. And then I really started to sort of explore with the idea of sort of um, creating composite images that could really. Um, you know, be dissected and taken apart to the point where I started looking at making anaglyph pictures. So, so those pictures that we just looked at um, were uh, turned into anaglyph pictures. So you put your um, your glasses on and they're, they're this one, isn't it? Yeah, you can just see the red and the green hue yeah. on, on, yeah. on that one. Um, so uh, yeah, and they were accompanied with a video as well. Um, and yeah, it was it was an opportunity. We could yeah. Shall I show? You the, to... Shall I play the video and then um, yeah, go on. Yeah, then. okay. Okay. So I think is this one silent, Rich? Or Hello, I'm silent? Richard. I'm here at the Somerset Heritage Centre, and I'm in the stores where all the machines are kept. Uh, we're talking about machines for domestic, industrial, agricultural use, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. And there's tools here as well. Um, and I was really interested in making photographs of these machines and presenting them in the exhibition. Um, another thing that I spotted that's all over the uh, stores at the Heritage Centre are these 
archive boxes. And what's really fascinating about these boxes is you don't really know what's in them. Sometimes you see a label on them and it gives you a clue as to what's inside. And I wanted to bring a little bit of that intrigue and that fascination of what's inside these boxes into my piece of work. So rather than make just conventional photographs or digital images, I've made anaglyph images. So I've kind of com combined lots of uh, images of machines together to create a composite image. And then using anaglyph technology, which is quite old technology and, and fun technology as well, a cyan lens and a magenta lens, when these are placed on the viewer, the image appears to be three-dimensional. So we'll see cogs and wheels and levers all placed in front of each other in a kind of fictitious machine. And these images will be placed inside these boxes. So when the audience comes to the gallery to see the work, they'll be able to, through little spy holes, look at these fictitious machines that never existed. We're back again. <laughs> yeah, so um, that video just illustrates the, how the anaglyph, what the anaglyph thing was all about. And, um, you know, that, that was, again, I, I was kind of moving into territory that, that was really quite far away from photography um, at that point. Um, and, um, yeah, it was quite liberating, I guess, I, I suppose. There was an element of lens-based media in it. There was photography within the process, but it was also about bringing in digital technology too. Mm. So if we if we go on to an, the next picture, Deb. Um, Which I think is this yeah, one. Yeah, that, that's just a quick example of um, uh, another composite picture. I was bringing some of the skills that I was learning into my sort of participatory work, the work that I was getting paid to do. Um, and. So th this was a, a triptych that was commissioned by um, South Petherton Community Hospital. And uh, so I work with a group of young people and we, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we interviewed a local person and who'd got this archive of old photographs and we selected photographs from the archive. <coughs> they also went out and photographed their own pictures of South Petherton and we, we work together to, to create this this um, image that I think is still up in, in the hospital to this day. Oh, fantastic. Um, but that gets me on to sort of talking about participation and, and actually if we just pick up the next picture, Deb. So I, I've done quite a lot of participatory work up, up till this point and, and actually after leaving my foundation course all those years ago and doing that work with the probation service and the youth service, I realised that actually, as much as anything, my practice is about me facilitating people. And it took me a while to get that, I think. And as a, an artist, whatever that means, you're often sort of, you know, at the centre of your own world. <laughs> and, you know, it's about your practice. And, and I actually realised years down the line that, well, part of my practice is actually in facilitating others. Yeah. And... That picture that you just saw, sort of glimpsed at there, this is a picture of a record player that um, has actually seen some use here as well, hasn't it, <laughs> at the end of it? certainly has. Um, this is, um, I mean, anything Damien has can do, you know, Ooh. I can have a go at too. <laughs> so this is a spin painting. So a picture of a spin painting being made by some very young children, three and four year olds. And um, uh, I, I was doing quite a lot of, sort of facilitation work and but I, was, I found I was doing quite a lot of work with in early years um, with th three four five year olds and the great thing about that work is that if that work if what you if what you bring to the space isn't any good then they'll just tell you <laughs> so that they'll either tell you or you'll know because they'll just walk they'll off. they'll switch off yeah yeah and, and they'll just walk off not interested, you know. So um, I learned so much more about that thing I was just saying earlier about entering into other people's worlds, and that's what facilitators do, I think. Um, you have to do that when you're doing early years, because if you turn up with a list uh, of things on an activity sheet, 
and you'll last five minutes. Uh, so, <laughs> not even five minutes. <laughs> so I realized actually the approach, uh, an approach to early years creativity is to um, just bring provocations with you. They're called provocations. So you bring like a record player yeah. and see what happens. And so that's what happened with that. So a record player came into the space and we could spin it, we could put things on it and they would spin off. And ideas were developing amongst um, the children and the early years practitioners and me as well. And this, I, and of course, I'm not sure whether it was Damien Hurst famously did it, but uh, I know people have made spin paintings for years, but that idea kind of evolved quite naturally. And uh, there's some examples of the, the images that the children created that really I got so excited about and so thrilled about because, again, there's a sort of formalness about them. There's a sort of, um, they're very beautiful, but they're, they're sort of very, they're quite minimal, really. Mm, yeah. um, and, but in doing this, not only were we making these very beautiful images so not only was it an exercise in visual arts it was also you know quite scientific because we got to talk about the viscosity of the paint and how really runny paint just when you pour it into the middle it just covers the paper in color straight away and you <laughs> so you get a, a kind of a, a, <laughs> you get a red and then green and then blue paint on you and then thicker paint runny paint uh, doesn't spin off, it'll slowly make its way to the edge as it spins. So we're dealing with really sophisticated ideas and concepts. And, I, you know, I was really learning so much myself about participation and about the creative process. And it, you know, it really stood me in good stead afterwards. I haven't, I haven't done any early years stuff for quite a while now, although I will be doing some quite soon again um, but I learned a lot about that there's, I think there's some more images um, again it's kind of that that intrigue and that sophistication and that abstractness that you get working with you know a three or a four year old where there's none of those frames of reference there's none of those rules of engagement it just is what it is you know if I want to paint my hands brand then I will <laughs> you know? yeah. and you know really good settings and really good practitioners just allow that to happen and the messiness you know uh, I think the next image is sort of demonstrate that demonstrates that whole idea of abstractness yeah of course it's an elephant on top of a cow why not yeah you know there's no rules of engagement here anything can happen and I love that but also very very beautiful things can happen you know, this is just, I mean, I've gotten through so much PVA doing, <laughs> doing work with early years. PVA and tissue paper, going on walks, collecting leaves, looking at the stuff that we don't think about, like shadows, our silhouettes and that kind of thing. I was going to say, it's still about light, isn't it? And yeah. The, you know, and... and uh, it yeah. is, it is. And shape. It, it, it certainly is. There's a video... Um, that we could show actually. Okay. Oh no, I'll just talk, tell you a little story about this one, just to sort of demonstrate that idea of anything can happen. Um, so I don't know anything about working with clay or ceramics, but that kind of doesn't matter really. I don't have to be a fine ceramicist to go and work with three and four and five year olds. I just have to enjoy the material. So <laughs> I took a great big lump of this stuff and dropped it on the table and this lad, made a little cube shape and one thing that you try not to do when you're working with very young children is ask what it is that you're making um so so i i, I didn't ask what this little boy was doing he made a cube and he stuck some buttons and things on it um different sort of provocations that i brought in a stick of cane stuck in the top and then he started walking around pressing these imaginary buttons so I, at that point, said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm controlling all the children. <laughs> so he was pointing at the children and, and pressing the buttons. And I just thought there's so much 
storytelling, theatre, n- nar- narrative, there's all sorts of sophisticated things going on, going yeah. on there. Um, the next video, if, if you show the light stream one, um, Yeah, the, yeah, this is this is the early years in a bit of a film. That's so yeah. cute. That's it is really cute. cute. Yeah. So that was Tim Hill, our very own Tim Hill, okay. playing in the background. You could probably tell. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I got to work with um, great early years theatre director. So my role on the, that light stream project was I desperately wanted to be in it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and I'm not a performer, and I realised that that when I watched that video back just. But um, I'm, I'm not a performer, and Frank, the guy in there, he, he's a professional performer. But I was, you know, working within this world of the arts, I get to have a go, and it's really great. Um, and you could hear the laughter of the children in the background who thoroughly enjoyed this quite uh, sophisticated, abstract, and quite surreal performance, you know. And, you know, so going back to that thing I, I said earlier, that, that experience in early years really taught me a lot. Um, and then we move on now to the next big milestone um, in my um, in my time as a creative practitioner, and getting a job. <laughs> I've, only, I've never had a job before. <laughs> I only ever sort of freelanced, and I had a job, and I got a job here at Somerset Film. <laughs> and so, so that was that was amazing. So, um, and. You know, I mean, for me to have a job, it had to be the right kind of job, obviously, because never having had a job before, uh, so it, it needed to be a job that afforded me a lot of freedom, <laughs> which it did, thankfully. <laughs> so, um, you know, just going back to that light stream thing that we just saw, that was sudden. You know, suddenly I was working with a theatre director and a performer, working in a space with an audience. And these were new experiences for me, and um, you know I was learning a lot. And those 
that, those are some of the experiences I was able to bring to the job here at yeah. Somerset um, on the Ignite project. So, um, yeah, really just being given that freedom was, was really fantastic. There's, there's actually some stills. Um, so uh, we're probably... Where are we at? Are we at this one? Oh. Yeah, so, so what, what's great is there's me at a creative network. You probably can't quite see what I'm doing. But um, I, I asked the artists, uh, oh, would it be all right if we did a little bit on um, uh, conventional photography and processing film? It was a few years ago now. So I was afforded the freedom to sort of shoot some pictures with the artists at the network. And we went through the process of, um, of developing them in a developing tank. Um, and the next picture, do you want me to scroll it through? Yeah, sorry, Rich. That's OK. And then the next picture uh, is of, let's have a look. Hang on, I need to put my specs on. <laughs> yeah, th this is our role of medium format film. Um, and it was great because this was only like, this isn't like, three years ago or so, everybody's taking photographs on their phones and with, with digital cameras, but it was still really exciting to see a roll of film being processed. And then this, I had to put this in, because it's, um, you know, where else can you do a job where you can broadcast on community radio and interview somebody wearing a bucket on their head? Uh, so this is uh, Fort Beard Theatre, and uh, uh, this was a little sketch that, they were, the guys were doing for me. And yeah, the, 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 the chap with the bucket on his head is, um, is, is actually in a submarine at the time. Um, and so, yeah, so that was the way they created that particular bit of Foley. And, and there's some videos that um, be quite nice to share. Um, the, just the projections on, on the buildings, um, because, Yeah, so yeah. I mean, that, I was surprised when I looked back at this. It was 2015. Wow. Seven years ago. Seven years ago? Yeah, no. But one of the first things I got to do on the. You know, and working with lots of artists and with some dancers and creating these, these um, sequences and, you know, using the best projector that we've got at the time, I think. <laughs> um, projecting onto the containers in Watch It. And, uh, you know, working with artists to see how they interpreted this, this, experience, this opportunity to project onto buildings. Um, doing some close-up photography. Um, and, you know, I got to meet artists through this process that um, I've kept in touch with throughout the whole of uh, it'd be Ignite, my time here on Ignite. So this is Halsey Manor, we did some projections on Halsey Manor. Figuring out how to put the projector onto the scaffolding, how to get power out to all of these logistical things. There's some beautiful images here that we've provided for this people. And then finishing off at the Princess Theatre with a silent disco kit and you know a real team effort and just there's a lovely shot of a guy dancing with the dance which I just love you kind of forget though Rich sometimes that you know this this was you kind of experimenting with it too because you made it look so easy and you made it such a smooth process for everybody kind of involved too so i've just been reminded as well that this started with morse code yeah do you remember that yeah bit? it was um you worked with the dj boy didn't you boy? yes yeah that's yeah. right and and we um we got we we um I mean, you can do anything online now, can't you? And we typed in the names of different towns and villages, like Watch It, um, South Petherton and so on, and we got the Morse code for those names. And we had, we highlighted parts of the map 
um, uh, the county of Somerset projected onto Halsey Manor. And when those were being illuminated, you could hear the Morse code. So, and that connected quite nicely with a sort of maritime tradition and, and all of that. So, so yeah, I mean, there was loads going on in that um, project and it was, uh, it was a lot of work, but it was kind of, I suppose a lot of the, the creative ambition had been sort of put in place within me anyway, through all those years of developing my own practice and then making that happen and getting on getting to understand how you need to work in a team and how you need to, um, you know, the logistical issues with getting a projector from one place to another and, and dealing with ambient light, like Belisha beacons that keep going on and off yeah. and, and all of that stuff. Um, you know, really big learning curve. But yeah, that, that was one of the first sort of big things I was involved in. And that follows on to the next um, video, which is the, um, the Wassailing project, which, which, which again was a lovely project that involved projecting again a few years ago, four years ago, four years ago. Um, Hang on, Rachel, we're only in 2021, three years ago. Three years ago, <laughs> yes, of course. Stop aging me. Yeah. Uh, and we, we projected beautiful, simple animated sequences on the theme of Wassail, um, at Wassail's throughout the county. I mean, what's, what's really moment. lovely about, about these events is, in a way, it's kind of like that magic that audiences would have experienced with magic lanterns, say. You know, just yes. seeing that that light illuminate, yeah. you know, and and these shapes being projected. Yeah, they really brought a lovely element to all of those events. It did. Yeah. And, they, and again, you know, this particular project came out of collaboration with others. So, mind, the arts, both in mind and mind had to be instrumental in that. So, thank you, uh, Rachel, for making yeah. that. How do you make that happen? Um, and so yeah, do, you know, helping facilitate the activities with the groups to make those animations was great. And then there was the whole thing about managing that big crowd of people, you know, and you know, managing events, which is a whole other skill set that um, but really, you know, really interesting and a lot of learning happening for me. And I think probably maybe the last last video we can look at. Yeah, the, just one more video in a moment, Deb, which, which sort of just sort of um, uh, demonstrates the freedom, I think, that I've, I've benefited from <laughs> working on the Ignite project and having a wild idea, or some would say a silly idea, but then just making it happen. So the, the, the kind of interventions that we would do going out to different towns and villages, uh, and this was just the... The, the video of the water piano, which I know you've seen. It sums up, I think. having a person ha walk down the street who happened to be a artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, happened to be a musician, but, but then just started playing with it completely. Yeah. So sort of, yeah, that I think for me personally, Ignite has been that brilliant opportunity to just play, actually have a lot of freedom myself. I've been very lucky to, to be part of it for eight years. And there's been challenges, 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't go to, into this. Yeah. No, no, but yeah, that, that, yeah. there has been time. You've the wrong cable. Oh. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but you've always brought that sense of yeah. play and fun to to everything, though, Rich. Yeah, and you know, and I've learned a lot as well. And and I think there's there's a lot to be said for um, kind of figuring it out as you go along. Yeah. And it's okay to do that. I yeah. don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, you know, with a, an artist's surgery, if, you know, there's a particular request to look at a particular idea, let, less so software, because you can look that up and, or you might know how to use it yourself. And, you know, you can sit down with somebody and teach somebody or work with somebody so that they understand the nuts and bolts of using software. But if it's a sort of a, a loose creative idea, I'd like to have a go at something. That's always, those sessions have always been the most exciting ones for me. And, and oftentimes I don't know how that conversation is going to go either. No. And you let it evolve and just see where it goes. And um, uh, yeah, some set of films have been, has afforded me the freedom to, to do that, which has been great. And, and mo do moving forward, do you think, do you think you'll continue to um, collaborate with with other artists or are you very much like no at the moment <laughs> I just want to <laughs> I just want to focus on on my work no I think I think um, I, I think the, there's lots of benefits to collaborating mm. uh, and there's as many challenges as well and so I suppose you just weigh it up don't you um, and clearly there's things that sometimes aren't in your skill set so you need to collaborate with somebody like a you know, a, a director of theatre, for example. Um, so, um, the, hopefully, there the will be those opportunities to collaborate in the future. I hope you're doing more performance as well, because although yeah. you say you're not a performer, <laughs> uh, there is a, that very nature of facilitating and working yes. with others. There is an element of performance in that, yes. isn't that? So there is, and you've always kind of shone at that. So I hope you. You do do more of that. Well, you get to an age, don't you, where you just think, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little bit like early years as well. I mean, they, they yes. don't they don't care. I mean, that, in that sense, they're yeah. not, you know, what's the word? Um, uh, I mean, sometimes they can be shy, but then... You yeah, know, then there's no following of the rules or no. the conventions. Yeah. So, yeah, so... And, and it might come out it might come from those experiences you know i just want to mention at, at this moment and obviously we'll open it up to, to to questions shortly so if anybody is watching online um and would like to to ask richard a question if you just put it in the comments um the wonder of technology now that it's working uh mm -hmm. will uh, afford me the opportunity to ask him those questions uh, directly and and of course for for those who have joined us uh, here in in the room as well we'll open it up to questions but perhaps is now a moment to kind of look at some of your more recent work and yeah yeah and perhaps talk about kind of what next yeah so uh, there's a sequence of photographs here and that you referred to Instagram earlier yeah <laughs> so um, so so let me just ask you ask you yes. quickly you'd already started taking these photos though hadn't you and and you actually shared them as part of the the our staff meeting, I seem yeah. to remember. So what? So kind of what happened? Just to give everybody a bit of context, was obviously when the pandemic hit, yeah. and we were all suddenly having to to work from home. Yes. We had our daily check-ins via Zoom every day, and one of the sort of um, things that was encouraged was to share our own creativity with one another. That's right. And th and now I think about it, it wasn't so much that you, you did inst Instagram first. Actually, you just started sharing your work first, this work. Yes. And then you went on to Instagram. Yeah, that's correct. It, so. No, you're absolutely right. I think um, probably, um, I suppose, yeah, lock, lockdown happened. And so a lot of the surgery sessions and so on that I was facilitating were happening online. <clears throat> and maybe... I thought to myself, I think I thought to myself, I've got to start making some work again of my own. <laughs> um, and But it needed to be simple and it couldn't really be something that involved people. Um, but I still have, I've always had that interest in making very formal, sort of quite minimalist images. Um, and so, and I've also always been interested in the idea of photography being the medium that um, shines a new light on everyday objects 
uh, and how something that is very humdrum and that you disregard can suddenly appear to be incredibly interesting and spectacular. And Irving Penn did this. The Irving Penn's a photographer, again, you can look, look Irving Penn up, uh, who made a series of photographs called Street Debris. Mm. And these are photographs uh, that are enormous and were made on a large format camera using film of cigarette butts, of cinema tickets, of random bits of litter <laughs> that were just dropped on the floor uh, in, in New York. And uh, he would photograph with a large format camera with bellows. The bellows were really extended, so basically it's an enormous macro camera, macro lens. And so small, sort of, he did whole massive books full of photographs of cigarette butts. <laughs> and it was all about the, how the disregard is and you know, the mundane can be incredibly visually striking and interesting. So that was in the back of my mind. Um, I didn't particularly want to walk around the chard picking up cigarette butts. <laughs> so um, I was quite interested in natural objects, and, but I was interested in Irving Penn's formal approach to composition. So I embarked on this project of making photographs, uh, some of these photographs that are minimalist um, and, and that are on a stark white background and that are just about the object. Um, and I was kind of quite interested in objects that were decaying as well and, and the, the sort of inherent, um, the inherent attraction that you have for things that are decaying how things can start to look really interesting when they're in the process of decay. Um, but they're all black and white. Um, again, it's that kind of idea of uh, a minimalist approach and, and, and the minimal palette, if you like. I think this one is my, I think it's my favourite one. It's so really dynamic, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah, it's so dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've made a 40 or 50 of these now. Sometimes I'll see something on a walk that, and, and I'll pick it up and I'll take it away with me, and um, uh, and it, it'll appear interesting in my hand. And then when I've got it through the, the macro lens and I'm looking at it, there's no interesting way of making a picture of it, and it just doesn't quite work. And then at other times, it just seems to pop out of the, uh, pop up through the lens <laughs> up at you. Um, and, you know, particularly those, those leaf shapes that are very, very simple, and some are very elegant, and some are really quite abstract. Um, so I'm in the process of making those and I'll continue to make those and I, I suppose social media is quite a good way of sharing work a lot of artists visual artists are sharing work on Instagram um, whether that I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing but it is quite good to get the feedback and yeah. to have an audience uh, to your work so that's something that I'm doing at the moment and I'm still facilitating projects with groups at the moment um, still doing little bits and pieces of work with Somerset Film. In fact, I was here today uh, um, screening an installation to, to a little plinth. So, um, so yeah, I'm still keeping busy. So uh, just tell us a little bit more about what, what next. Can you tell us a bit about the commission that you're going to be? So there's a commission. I can't say too much because it's not being formally announced. But <laughs> I am working on a, a commission uh, here in Somerset that's going to involve, it's called Through the Looking Glass. And it's going to bring everything that I've learnt over the years and my significant years here at Somerset Film to the fore into, um, a kind of, uh, into an installation that will be for uh, four to five weeks um, next spring. And it's going to be an opportunity for... It's, it's, um, it's going to touch on themes associated with climate change and the climate crisis. And what it will do, will it, it will allow the visitor to walk into the space and skip through billions of years of life on Earth. They'll be able to skip right back to when single cell life mm -hmm. existed, only single cell life existed on, on, the, on the surface of the Earth, because um, I've got some footage of that. <laughs> and, and or they might they might then only skip they might then skip a few million years uh, forwards 
to a time when there's multicellular life on Earth. Skipping forward millions of years, a mere sort of maybe, is it a million or is it a million and a half years ago to the Cambrian period where the first animal life appeared. We're now talking about animals that can engineer their environment around them and, and uh, structurally change things around them. And then skip through to other, through eons and, and uh, 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 millions of years, through to the present day and even into the future. So I just happen to have footage of all this stuff. <laughs> uh, and the idea is that uh, that visitor will, will be able to comprehend their insignificance. Within the scale of it all. Within the scale of it yeah. all. Um, that's the idea. So it's not a piece that's going to be preachy, although it might be when it gets to it, I don't know. Uh, it's not going to have somebody there telling people how to lead a more sustainable life, although there might be companion pieces with it that do do that, because it would be a shame if people couldn't learn stuff as well. Mm. But the piece in of itself will be designed to engineer a feeling of insignificance. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a way I wanted to do. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's going to keep me quite busy through to spring. Has there been a bit of technology that you've not been able to explore that you'd quite you'd quite like to? And you might not have been able to explore to it because you haven't had access to it or because it's uh, not quite ready or No, I, I think it's an interesting question. And you know, whilst I was here at Somerset Film I got to play with some applications and with some ideas that were really at the forefront of you know digital creative experimentation um, uh, and I only ever scratched the surface of some of those applications and I learned some of you know the language of those applications if you like and what you can do with them through working with other artists and so we would sort of set our parameters fairly narrowly uh, and just try to create we, we had a show at the brew house I remember where we were doing things with projections we had a show here um, where we had a little pool of water that you could tap and it ripples and so and I've seen these applications being used in, in incredible ways um, so I don't think it's so much a technology I haven't explored. I think having more time now to really properly explore what can be achieved with some of those technologies yeah. is going to be something that I'll be doing. Does anybody here have any questions that they'd like to ask Richard? Don't feel obliged. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about really kind of curious about this. I mean, seeing your own work, which I look, I'd seen it on, 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 online, I think, several times. And uh, I, I worry in a way, this sense that you're doing all this facilitating, you know, amazing things which we, we free, are free benefiting from tremendously. And yet you've got this world of your own. And I wondered how you dealt with the two together in your time. Mm. Yeah, it, I didn't sometimes. It's, it's a real challenge, I think, mm. uh, to do that. Um, and I think and whenever I was facilitating, it's a funny word, isn't it, really, that we use quite a lot. Um, all I, I suppose we really was doing was being with another artist and listening to their story and sharing some of my stories. That's all that facilitating <laughs> was ever. That's all it's ever been to me, I think, particularly here at Somerset Film. It's been about listening to your frames of reference and how you do things. And then I'll share some of my frames of reference. And, and then somewhere in the middle, the, something emerges. So it's never been like I've had to take out hours of my day to prepare activities. Sorry, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, for, for sessions. Sometimes that has been the case, uh, particularly if it's with a group of, you know, a, a group in the community, a group of young people or something like that. Clearly, you know, you might have um, 
uh, a schedule of things to do. Um, but with artists, rather than being facilitating, it was more just about conversations most of the time and about dialogue. And, and often the participants that I was working with, sometimes those participants were brought to me by artists anyway, like through Mind, for example. And then really, it was just like talking to artists again, really, because everybody's creative and everybody's got ideas. And I suppose, I suppose all that I was trying to do was to get people to recognize their creative impulse as well. So, but it was, I suppose it was, and is time consuming though, um, so it was always, there were, it is always that tension of trying to eke out a bit of time for your own practice, I well, suppose. It must be a challenge in, just in terms of the headspace that you're in though, though Rich, well, because you have, head, yeah. <laughs> well, no, because you have given so much time to others and you have facilitated and, yeah. you know, there's no doubt about it. This is a, a really busy environment that has demanded a great deal of you. So, you mm. know, even, even though we talk about, you know, you having time to make work, it, it really didn't because I think because you also other put you put other people first. Yeah, I think that's that's the reality. You've always given so much of yourself, so wow. you know. No, but you did, you have. It's probably, well, it's probably yeah. It's probably um, I think it's probably not that. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably more about just being excited about the work. Yeah. And, and, and you know, yeah. somebody comes to you with an idea and it's a good idea. I mean, that's that's fantastic, isn't it? So it's probably more <laughs> that than anything else. Getting carried away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, and there are people out there in the engine room community that have amazing ideas. And when when they approach you and say, oh, can you help with this? It's kind of it's two two things. One is how fantastic of you to share that with me. And number two, yeah, let, let's see what we can do uh, together. Uh, and and, and in, in the case of Ignite Somerset, see where a digital element can, you know, enhance it or make it happen or make it a reality. Yeah. Did anybody else? I was going to bring up a question, but uh, I just wanted to say what an opportunity you get, you know, while we're here to say thank you for everything you've done for me. And, and for us, I you never know, thought ever that in my artistic career, or whatever you want to call it, that I'd be doing anything to do with computer games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make that happen. <laughs> you know, and yeah. it, was, it was amazing. You know, so much time. So yeah, I'm really, really grateful, as I'm sure everybody else is. Well, it was a great idea. Well. <laughs> it's okay. no, 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 things are time consuming uh, and actually it's an interesting point because digital technology and I learned this myself digital technology promises so much doesn't it it promises the world and it's never been easier and in some respects it has never been easier to shoot amazing photographs, for example. But most things that are worthwhile and are very creative do take a really long time to make and, and to prepare for. Um, and that, yeah, the computer game is a case in point. Yeah. Well, so it's always like that, those adverts though, isn't it, with a, with a phone where they, and, and in the bottom it'll say, sequence shortened. You know, <laughs> that idea that you can just go, hey, Yes. Alexon, do this. Yes. And it'll magically do it. And it just, and that's not really how it works. No. <laughs> it's just not how it works. I think it's fantastic the way, you know, you started off with photography and that was sort of immediately, you know, you had that idea of technology right from the beginning, didn't you? Like yeah. Looking at glass doors. Yeah. Through some sort of technology. And yeah. then we get to the piano, which was a, to, you know, that's sort of the connection yeah. between those things. Yeah, who'd have thought it? Yeah. It's very playful, isn't it? You sort of. Yes. You're not trapped by the technology. Yeah, yeah no, that's imagine. an interesting phrase, being trapped by the technology. And, and I think you can be trapped by, by technology in a number of different ways. 
Um, there's that sense of instant gratification that some technology gives you, uh, whereby you, uh, you know, and this didn't happen on Ignite some set of course, but um, you know, the, the, the sense of instant rewards and instant results by, you know, pressing a few buttons on a keyboard. And, uh, but you always have to ask yourself, where is the creativity in what you've just done? Yeah. Yes. You did it with Sue, didn't you? you yes. Did it around town. And that was just like, it was just magical, you know. It was, mm. so it's kind of using technology, but just a use case of going through it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. It, it kind of gave me an idea of what you Yeah. Like yeah. Like yeah, play, playing with the scale of projections, you know. They could be small or they could be big. Yeah. We've, got, we've got a question that's come in online for you. Da -da -da, oh, from the lovely Hello. Natalie. <laughs> Hi, Natalie. Hello, Matt. So there you go. Hey, Rich. Question for you. If you had all the resources in the world available you to, to you to create one piece of work, okay. what would you create? What medium would you use? That's a really good question. And what theme would it be on? Oh, my goodness me. Thanks, Nat. That's a really hard question. <laughs> um, if I had all the resources in the world, it, I don't know whether you were there at the beginning, Nat, um, but it would. I'd probably want to have a think to start with <laughs> <laughs> about, you know, what are my um, influences, what has inspired me, and it'd probably be something. It would be from that sort of those childhood experiences growing up and that that whole fascination with iconography and minimalism and making images that are revered. And though I make a lot of films, I'd probably make a still image. I'd probably make I'd probably make the biggest photograph in the world ever <laughs> of something that is um, very mundane but that looked spectacular in, in an attempt to make people really think about their place on the earth <laughs> and to just get to, you know, perhaps to get people to connect with the little things that are so incredibly important. Um, so that's a roundabout way of answering it. So what I would make is the biggest photograph in the world and it, uh, and it would be a very minimalist thing. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. I don't know where it could be positioned. Somewhere. Brent Knoll or somewhere like that, just so that yeah. everyone from the M5 could see it. Yes, <laughs> yes, but it would. Be, yes, but the key thing is, that it would be, it would be, um, it would be something very small and minimal on a massive scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> Any other questions? No. no? Well, um, Rich, I just want to once again thank you for, for everything you, you've done. Um, it's just been wonderful working with you these last eight Likewise. years. And we are going to get to continue to work with you. So, um, and again, even at the moment, if, if artists out there would li like to access um, an Ignite Digital Surgery, then Richard is still are working with us to to deliver those mm -hmm. um, and we've got lots of other projects um, and I just you know we've had such fantastic conversations we've bounced ideas around and you know yeah. you've always gone yeah let's do that <laughs> <laughs> and it's just been an amazing ride and I really can't thank you enough it's lovely. Uh, thank you well, likewise it's been a pleasure <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Um, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. The next Creative Network is on November the 27th, and I promise to, um, to have it all sussed by then. <laughs> but you could also just tune in and, you know, we might win 250 quid on it. You've been framed because I've mucked it up again. <laughs> but um, thanks to Richard. Thanks for everyone who, who's joined us and look forward to seeing you again at the Creative Network next time. Thank you.
I know I ain't. 